in the studio. It's still live here on 3FM Sunrise. On 3FM 92.7, it is the best breakfast show in all of the land. Thank you so much for deciding to start your morning with us. Let's change gears right about now. I've got a very special guest in the studio this morning. And we're going to be speaking with George Opare Addo, Esquire, National Youth Organizer from the National Democratic Congress Party, known in some circles as Pablo. Good morning to you, sir. How are we doing? Good morning, Helen. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Um, great to have you in studio. We haven't met before, but a uh, pleasure. Nice meeting you, Helen. Well, how are you doing? How's uh, things in the NDC quarters? The year is 2024. Very, very busy year for you guys. Um, let me say good morning to those listening to us. And let me say that the NDC is doing very well. Mm. We are battle ready for the elections, and I can assure everybody that, come what may, His Excellency John Drummond Mama is headed for the Flagstaff House. You say you're battle ready? Ever ready. The, cri- the, the critics don't seem to, to think so. If you gauge the temperature, especially on social media, because I live on social media, connecting especially with the youth, you know, picking the feelers, in some quarters they think that the minority is not battle ready. It is not a critics that matter. It is mm. a man in the arena that matters. John Mahama is a man in the arena. Mm. And we are telling you, we are battle ready. How has the Building Ghana tour uh, been going? Is it over now? No, it's not over. But okay. It's, it's, it's gone very well so far. Mm. Um, it's more like a listening tour, going around, meeting the right people, interacting with them, and listening to them at first time, what their challenges are and what confronts them. And all that is happening is being fed into our manifesto. Mm. So what His Excellency is doing is he has people behind who are taking down notes of all the issues that are coming up. Mm. And so when they get back, it is giving back to the manifesto team to look at how best they can fashion out programs that will best solve the problems that confront the people wherever we go to. And so when I say we are battle ready, we are battle ready because we have interacted at first time with the people, we have listened to them, and then our manifesto, when it's launched, will be addressing majority of the problems that are confronting the ordinary Ghanaian. Mm. So you would describe this manifesto as one that is for the people, by the people? It is always. Last four years, our manifesto was called the People's Manifesto. The People's Manifesto. I don't really believe the theme is going to change. It's the same concepts that we are adopting, listening to the people and infuse whatever their demands are into the manifesto. Those that are feasible, some of the demands are a bit outrageous and it cannot be done. What are the people demanding for? Oh, um, it depends on, for instance, your demands may be different from that of TV3. Right. As a 3FM. Mm-hmm. What you require here may be entirely different from what TV3 is demanding, So, but you're on the same premises. Mm. And so wherever we go, after interacting with the people, there is a small committee that sits down and puts all of them together and then feeds it to the manifesto committee. We have a think tank led by Professor Dan Zuboa for called the lab. They now come up with solutions mm. that best fits what the demands are and like I said when we are done and the manifesto is launched you realize that it's a manifesto that connects with the average Ghanaian it's a manifesto that deals with the everyday problems of the Ghanaian it is not a manifesto that has fanciful promises in but it's a manifesto that tells you about the basic things that we need to keep our economy going it's a manifesto that is going to resolve the issues of job unemployment Currently, the biggest problem that confronts the average Ghanaian mm. is the issue of jobs. Right. 14.8% of our working population are unemployed. And out of that 14.8%, 32.8% of them are young people within the 18 to 25-year-old bracket. That's right. They don't have jobs. Mm. And so we are coming out with a manifesto that reflects the needs and aspirations of the people, especially young people. That's right. About 60% of our voter population are youthful. Mm. And so if you don't find tangible jobs. There are people who, are, who have jobs but then don't have job satisfaction. You need job satisfaction for those people. And so if you want your country to develop, if you don't want crime to be on the increase, then you must find proper solutions to this menace that is confronting us. And that is exactly what our manifesto of 2024 is going to achieve. From page one to the very last page, mm. there are issues uh, it, it borders on job creation, job creation, job creation. And His, His Excellency has made mention that he's going to establish a ministry for just youth development. Mm. He's going to separate the Ministry of Youth and Sports and then there's going to be a sole ministry for just youth development. That is going to focus on issues that confront young people 
from issues of rent, from issues of education, farming, agriculture, everything that affects young people. And that ministry is going to cut across all ministries. And even yesterday at the dialogue at Wisconsin, he made mention of it again. Mm. So clearly, he knows where he's going to. He knows what confronts the people of this country. And he, he, he has solutions to deal with it. And that is why I'm so confident that His Excellency is the best person mm. at this material moment to lead Ghana out of the mess we find ourselves in. Well, the former president, uh, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, has also asked for a bit of a honeymoon period. And that was received in a very interesting manner because on, on, on the one side, those who understood where he was coming from says that, well, given our circumstances, it, it will take some time to rebuild. On the other side, uh, you know, concerned Ghanaians are saying that we, don't, we can't afford uh, any kind of honeymoon, any kind of break. We are in a severe quagmire. Time is of the essence. Can you, you know, put more flesh on those bones? What does a honeymoon period mean like you know Ghanaians are waiting for a solution when when he spoke about honeymoon he mm. spoke about it in a certain context that's right it is the naysayers that are just twisting what he said mm. or concerned he, Ghanaians who maybe want some more context okay so then let's call them concerned Ghanaians yes but he spoke in a certain context mm. and so if you take him out of context and you decide to put a spin on it right uh, then you are being so unfair but what he said was that where we find ourselves today, and we all admit, even His Excellency Nana Dankwe Kufata, the current president, has said that it will take a new leader to fix the mess we are in. Mm, he said that, yes. Yeah, he said that. So clearly, we all acknowledge the fact that we are in a mess. We've dug ourselves into a pit. And so to be able to be, to be brought to equilibrium, it will take time. When he asked for honeymoon, he didn't say he's not going to hit the ground running immediately. Okay. He said that Ghanaians will have to be patient. Because of where we find ourselves now, you will not see results immediately. It is going to take time for results to be seen. But we are capable. We are going to fix it. But you see, when it is broken and you are fixing, Helen, if I decide to break down this studio, mm. within a minute I can easily break it down. Right. But if I decide to rebuild it, before I lay the foundation, and at the foundation stage, you don't see the building come up. Mm. You only see the building come up when I get to the lintel and then I roof it. Then you see that the building is up and then you begin to see that some work has been done. That is exactly what His Excellency was talking about. That you need to give us a honeymoon. Honeymoon in the sense that where we are now, we need to go back to the basics. We need to start fixing it from the base. Right. It is so broken that we must tackle it right from the roots. And so by the time we are done tackling it from the roots, you may not see that stage. You may be, and you see, Ghanaians are impatient at the moment because of where we find ourselves. That's right. Rightly so. You can't blame them. Mm. So when he asks for a honeymoon period, all you're saying is that I'm going to get a problem fixed. I am a problem solver. I am the nation builder. I will fix it. But you need to give me time to be able to see the results. And like I've, I, I've, I've, I've told you, you cannot see results right from the So you're saying this is realistic messaging, exactly. being real with the people. Being real with the people. And he's always said that he doesn't have to lie to the people because he wants power from them. He's not like the other side. He's, he's a real person. He says it the way it is. When we had Dumso, he was bold enough to go before the people of Ghana and say, I am your president. I didn't cause Dumso. It is a problem we've inherited. Successive governments did not add on. But I, as a president who has come to be confronted with this problem, I take full responsibility and I am going to deal with it and I'm going to solve it. As early as September 20, uh, 2016, President Mama had solved Dumso. He had increased capacity, he had introduced ESLA to fix the energy sector debt. And then we had increased capacity. He had brought on board Ameri, he had brought on board Car Power, and then the T3, T4 were all, all coming upstream. So clearly, this is a leader who identifies problem, doesn't shy away from it, gets to the roots of it, and fixes it. Mm. He doesn't behave like the others who never accept responsibility and always blame their predecessors for the mess they find themselves in. As far as the power issues are concerned, hold that thought for me because we will certainly come back to that given uh, what we're now seeing. Uh, I'll ask whether or not you are also uh, clamoring for a timetable. Um, in certain quarters, they call that wishing evil on the nation, but uh, I digress. Uh, now, uh, another intervention or an intervention that the NDC hit the ground running with is this 24-hour economy, um, shall I say, Maybe policy or intervention or what what we call it? Um, it's a policy. A policy. It's a policy. Uh -huh. And you see, for every policy to take effect, you need a legal framework for it. Right. And so His Excellency has said that when we assume office, we will go through the legal framework and get Parliament to pass the requisite laws 
that will be needed to address the problems that confront our economy. He's also set time with our number that it is not going to be imposed. Okay. It is not going to be it's not going to be imposed on anybody, but anybody who agrees to sign on to it will be given some incentives. So if it's not an imposition, what would make it attractive for... No, that, that's yes. why I said that. So anybody who signs on to mm. it will be given some, some support, kind of, some rebates, especially with electricity, for instance. President Mama said that anybody who is on the policy, if you decide to run 24 hours, between a certain hours... Your electricity will be halved for you. You will get some rebates on your electricity. Mm. Some taxes, uh, tax incentives will also be given to companies and organizations that decide to sign on to the 24-hour economy. But the main question is, what is the 24-hour economy? Right. The 24-hour economy is a three-shift economy. Okay. In some quarters, it's even a four-shift economy. Three shifts in the sense that we have eight-hour shifts for each period. We have 24 hours during the day. So mm. between that 24 hours... You do eight hours, I come and do eight hours, your producer does eight hours. So around the clock, there is somebody sitting behind the console. Mm. And so you ask, how do I benefit? Is right. It, if you have not had an emergency before, and you've not been rushed to the hospital before, you may not even appreciate a 24-hour economy. But God forgive me, you are involved in a little incident in the house or mm. an accident, and then you are rushed to the hospital. There is always a nurse on duty. That's right. Those nurses have always been doing 24 hours. That's right. But doctors are not always on duty. Mm. So now they have to call a doctor. You get lucky, a doctor is rushed in. Now they have to do a lab. The lab technician starts from 8 and closes at 5. At 5 p.m., he's gone home. So you have to wait or they have to refer you to another hospital that has a lab technician on duty. But if you have a lab technician on duty, if you are lucky, you'll be able to do your lab, tell the doctor exactly what is wrong with you, and you will get treatment. Mm. You were involved in an altercation or something and you need to do an x-ray. Mm. The x-ray technician is closed. You have to wait the next morning, so you need to endure the pain. And so if you have a policy that says that everybody's going to work 24 hours, what it simply means is that instead of employing one lab technician, right. there will be three. So then with the healthcare, is there a move then to make that an imposition or compulsory? Is it, is it with government agencies? Right. They will be compulsory. Okay. Government agencies. That, and you know, the 24-hour economy is demand-driven. Okay. So areas where there is demand, it is going to be compulsory. Okay. But with private sector, people who do production, people who are into manufacturing, it will depend on the need of the people. Mm. So, I think that's an important distinction there, that, that for the private sector, you make it attractive exactly. so that those who want to come on board exactly. will come on board. But for the government sectors, Success. you can make that in position or, 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 or make it a policy, policy that this is to run 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and like I said, it's demand-driven. Right. So, for instance, the hospitals should be running 24-7. Mm. And so if they are employing... And the job opportunities for young people, so if they are employing one nurse to do an eight-hour shift. Right. Another nurse is going to do... Uh, another hospital is going to do a 24-hour shift. What it means is that instead of employing one person, they will employ two additional, making a three. Same for doctors, same for health prof all the other health professionals. The good news is that, Helen, when you come to work in the morning, you yeah. get hungry, right? I do. So you definitely eat. That's right. When you come in the afternoon, you get hungry. So you definitely... When you come in the evening or at dawn, you may also get hungry. Mm. So you may end up eating. Right. Right. So what it means is that if there is a canteen around, mm -hmm. because the whole hospital is running 24 hours, it is just like they. they so like working. a ripple effect, because ripple they know effect. that there will be people exactly. working, the canteen will also exactly. be staying exactly. open. Exactly. Okay. And so that, that, that sector of the economy will also get some boost because mm. that side will also be working. Now, for instance, police, fire service. Right. Because all these organizations are working at night, we need to increase the number of police Man, the mm. force will have to be increased because they must provide round the clock security. Right. We need to increase fire service because we need to have fire service round the clock mm. on standby so that when there are any emergencies, they can attend to their people. Do they not already run that sort of shift in these emergency services? H have you been, have you, I've been an MC before. Mm. And so when I speak, I speak with authority. I right. understand how these organizations work. Mm. They are supposed to, but most often, they are before short of labor. So you think a deliberate policy is what would fill these gaps? Fill these gaps, and that mm. is exactly what we are coming up with. Okay, you understand. And when I said in some sectors is a four shift economy instead of a three shift economy, right? Because you run twenty four hours, you do Monday to Friday. 
you need to take two days off per the labor act. Mm. Somebody else does the same five days. Somebody else does the same five days. So all three of you may be doing three shifts, uh, your, your shifts. But then there, are that, there is that gap. So when you are off, somebody must fill your space. That's that two right. days that you are not working. Mm -hmm. When the second shift is off, somebody must fill that two days. Yes. When the third shift is off, somebody must also fill those two days. Mm. So the person who fills that, it becomes a fourth shift. Do you, do you get it? Yeah. And so technically, even though we say it's a three-shift economy, mm -hmm. it is a four-shift system. Mm. Because when you are off, your your off days, the job must still go on. So when you are off, somebody feels it. When the other person is also off, somebody feels it. When the other person is, is also off, either than that, somebody else will have to do overtime. Now, feasibly, how long would a policy like this take to uh, sort of take off the ground? And if you are listening to His Excellency President Mama on the many platforms he's spoken, mm. it is one of the policies that we are ready to roll out. Okay. All we need is a legal framework. Mm -hmm. And so it will be one of the first bills that will be presented to the, to, to the parliament when to parliament when his excellency has his office and m maximum three months we should have it rolling out mm. maximum three now months. one of the biggest concerns that uh, the average Ghanaian has because we sit you know behind the console we listen to Ghanaians all day all night is the issue of corruption corruption continues to decimate the public purse in fact uh, it, uh, shall i say in the last 12 months alone we've been been riddled the news has been riddled with all, all manner of corruption scandals. This has put Ghanaians on high alert, the issue of corruption, how much money we lose. We're collecting money into a basket full of holes. What is the, the NDC's uh, uh, um, plan, policy, proposal to put a stop to w what we're seeing now? Because it's, it, it's, it's worrying. There are people who say, well, given what we're seeing, a lack of accountability, will the NDC then think, ah, fantastic. The Ghanaian people are used to this, so this is our time to shine. It's a legitimate concern. Yes, rightly so. But you see, if you know the man, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, apart from the negative press he enjoyed from the media when he was president, if anybody has boldly fought corruption, if anybody has brought reforms to the corruption front, it's John Mahama. The anti-corruption bill that was passed was passed by President John Dramani Mahama. When he was president, it was during his time that a minister of state under his presidency, a member of parliament from his party, were put before court. And today, forgive me, but people like Abu Gapele and co went to prison because President Mama allowed the processes to follow. Mm. He didn't become a clearing agent and clean of them. He was not a mother serpent of corruption. Who are you referring to? The mother serpent of corruption is another than Kweku Fuado. It is boldly written around him. Uh, he's bathed in the corruption at all. He's wearing the corruption regalia. During his time, the, the indexes has proven that he's the most corrupt leader Ghana has ever seen. And so you cannot shy away from it. He's corrupt. Everybody around him is corrupt. Mahmoud Baumia is corrupt. If your brothers or sisters on the other side were here, they'd vehemently oppose Let that. Let them come with the evidence. We have proof. He appointed the OSP. The OSP wrote and said that he is the mother serpent of corruption. It is only a coup father that clears his ministers when they are guilty. When we had found money, over $5 million under somebody else's bed, he came out to tell us that he believes the system is going to clear the, the, the person. This is a man when anybody is found guilty or allegations are made against anybody, he first comes out to exonerate the person before even the state agencies get into doing their job. And when you do that, how are they going to come up with any other reports? Because the president says you are not guilty. How would the BNI or the National Security or the police come and say that you are guilty when all those who are seated there are appointees of the president? And so you see, President Mama's corruption record is way better and far better. This is a man who declared his assets and made everybody within his government declare his assets. When President Mama was president, we saw the bills that were passed in respect to fighting corruption. Mm. And so clearly, if you are talking about corruption, I can assure you that President Mama is the right person to lead us in fixing the mess we find ourselves in. How? Practically, George? Practically, like I said, when he became president... What will be different in the future? So we've gone into the past, but for the future, the Ghanaian people want to know how is he going to, he to, to time, curb that? He set time without number. He set time without number that if we cut the waste in the system, we will find money to fix most of our challenges. Even yesterday, mm. he emphasized that on putting together some ministries. For instance, the, the transport ministry, bringing back aviation 
and then railways all under the transport ministry, combining information and communication as one ministry. When you have too many arms of government, too many agencies under government, it's an avenue for corruption. So when they are smaller, you can keep an eagle eye on all of them. President Mahama is one leader who is committed to the fight against corruption. And in our 2020 manifesto, because our 2024 manifesto is not ready yet, I can only make references to the 2020 manifesto. Right. We have about four pages mm -hmm. on how to tackle the issue of corruption, how to re-equip state agencies and make them independent again. Today, most of our state agencies are just there, but they become an appendage of the president. Mm. And so the president decides because you are not even given liberties to do what you have to do. That's right. What we can do and what we are going to do and what we stated in our 2020 manifesto is that we're going to give state agencies the right to do their own thing, to, to re resource them, build capacities, and give them the needed support they deserve. So that when an issue goes before strike, you don't get somebody from the office of the president interfering and telling them what to do. Mm. When an issue goes to the police, you don't get a president issuing a statement and saying that this person is not corrupt. The systems are going to be allowed to work so that corruption does not become part and parcel of us. We need to clean ourselves of, of that canker. If we don't, we'll still be losing a lot of money and revenue to it. And then our developments will be stalled. And that is not what we are seeking for. We are seeking at building a better Ghana. The Ghana you and I want. And that has been the theme of our campaign. Building the Ghana we want together. And in doing so, we intend to make sure that corruption becomes a thing of the past. We are not going to make it attractive. Anybody who is found culpable, is going to be dealt with, and the president is not going to shield anybody. You say yeah. without fear or favor? Yes, without fear or favor. Mm. And you see, he, he has a track record. Like I said, during his time, we saw what happened with Jida. Mm. Jida didn't happen during President Mahmoud's time. It happened when he was vice president. But when he became president, he investigated it. And people who were found guilty and culpable faced the full rigors of the law to the extent that a certain member of parliament from his own party ended up in jail. Mm. That is leadership you can trust. Well, time check. It is some 18 minutes to the top of the hour, 9 a.m. We're still live here on 3FM Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. We're speaking with the national youth organizer of the NDC, George Opare Ado. Some of you know him as Pablo. In fact, the uh, comments on the stream do keep them coming. Um, uh, hey, George, have you paid some people to write these uh, glowing reports on our Facebook page. Um, Jack Don says he doesn't talk much, but he gets the job done. Uh, Makawawa, Man Pablo, um, they want to know if you even sleep. They say you, you, you work too much. Um, and some more comments on here. Do keep them coming. We're streaming live on the socials. Find us on Facebook and also on X, formerly uh, Twitter. We have George here. If you've got questions you want to add on to the conversation, uh, please do so. Let's change gears and talk about the passport application fees. We've seen um, them go up astronomical. In fact, as of April 1, 2024. Um, these are the prices effective immediately. So a passport, a 32-page passport that once cost 100 CDs will now set you back some 500 Ghana CDs. For the 48 pages, it once cost 150 CDs. It will now cost you 644 CDs. Yesterday, we connected with Honorable Samuel Okujito Ablaka. He's a ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Parliament. And he had a lot to say. He says the minority opposed these fees and had offered some advice to do this um, incrementally. George, what are your thoughts on this? I'm sure it came as a shock to you as well. Given the economic challenges, uh, 540 increment. You see, Helen, governments must show concern to its citizens. Mm. And um, the economy is so bad, it's so broken, to the extent that even a day's meal is a big challenge for the ordinary Ghanaian today. That's right. And so if you are introducing fees and levies, you look at the prevailing economic conditions and then you impose those fees. So that if the people are able to pay for it, those are the questions you should be asking. Because we, we elect governments to solve the problems of the people. We don't mm. elect governments to become a burden and a problem to the people. Unfortunately for you and I, now now the Dan Kwa Mahmoud administration has rather become a burden for you and I to solve. And so when you decide to increase passport fees, it is through no mess, through, through, through no fault of ours. Mm. But today the dollar is selling at almost 14 cities. That's right. It is true no fault of ours as citizens that the economy is in a bad shape. It is true no fault of us 
but you've not been able to manage the country well. And so when you are imposing fees, you should be mindful of the fact that the economy itself is going through difficulties and challenges. You've not increased salaries for the ordinary Ghanaian worker. The ordinary Ghanaian worker is still struggling with his base salary. Most of your labor unions are on strike. Almost all the four teacher unions are on strike, as I speak to you. I believe, have they not called off that strike? I think they went back to the table. Yes, they've they called off the strike. The, are you sure? Yes. I think in some, yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from the back room. I, I believe in some schools, uh, teaching and learning has resumed. Not sure if that's happening across, across the, country, the country, though. Yes. But, but if in the last two, three weeks, mm. all your teacher unions were on strike, mm. clearly something doesn't sit right with them. Mm. And so when you decide to impose levies, and taxes and fees, you must be reasonable in doing so. And the question you should ask is, are the citizens able to pay? If not, then what do you do? Increasing it from 100 cities to 500 cities clearly is not right. We're told that we pay some of the cheapest ap passport application fees um, in our part of the world. So, you know, where are there's, uh, we're paying about $8 in the dollar equivalent. Other countries around us, Togo and so on and so forth, are paying, you know, much higher fees. Granted, of course, with printing, we know that the more that you print, um, the cost should reduce. So uh, putting us side by side or juxtaposing our, our, our numbers with a country much smaller to ours could not be the right metric to use. But at least we know we're paying very low amounts. So some increment is not far-fetched, George. No, so some increment. Right. If I'm at 100 cities and you take me to 300 cities, that's fair. Mm. But if I'm at 100 cities and you jump me to 500 cities, 400 cities difference, that is unfair. Mm. And that is all we are talking about. Mm. If I'm at 150 and you take me to 600 cities, that is unfair. And did, did you get the picture? Mm. Mm. And so we are not saying don't increase. We believe that with the times ahead and to be able to provide the ne necessary services, at least some increases year on year on, it's fair. Mm -hmm. But those increases should be reasonable to the ordinary Ghanaian. Those increases should be such that I am able to pay for them. Should the ministry go back to the table and come again? You know, governments don't go back to the table and come again in instances like this. Mm. I mean, we see it, for, for example, when government wanted to charge us VAT on electricity, 15%. No, the uproar, the, the energy the, behind the law, that. The law had not been passed. That's right. You understand the implementation. You know, when laws are made, there is a bill for implementation. Mm. That had not happened. That's right. That is why you and I got away with it. Mm. But this Nana and Kamasem administration, now that he started charging, what happened to E-Levy? The promises that were made to us on E-Levy. That's right. Have they fulfilled them? No. Mm. And so clearly they will not go back to the table, especially when they are hard-pressed for revenue and their system is so broken. They are not going to go back to the table. Once they've decided to charge it, and I even heard somebody say that the minister says that if you cannot pay, then you should not, be, you should not travel or something. Yes. It is an unfair comment. Mm. When citizens complain, they complain because they expect you to find solutions to their problems. You don't rub it in and tell them things like this. Mm. It is so unfair. And this government has become so rude and arrogant. And I don't know where that arrogance comes that from. That is the, your, your assessment of their communication style? Exactly. But, but you see, for instance, like the energy minister, I know we'll be getting into it. Yes. If you want to do some time table, come out with your own time table. That's right. That is rude. Mm. When my taxes are used in paying, you don't speak to me like that. Mm. You sit at you sit at that office at my behest because I. He says you are you, you naysayers, people like yourselves. You are wishing evil because wish you are evil? using it as a how political wish, tool. How do we wish evil when I cannot plan my life? Mm. I get to my office at seven a.m. I don't have a generator. I have a meeting scheduled for nine a.m. and then by seven thirty my light is taken. If I knew the light was going to go off, I would reschedule my meeting. So when I ask for a timetable, and I, I do not... It's not because you are the NDC exactly. youth organizer no. and you want to, no. to make a big no. hula baloo no, about it. I want to plan my life. I want to plan. If I don't have to get to the office at this time, I don't go. I go do something else. Is it premature for the ECG to release a timetable? No, but the PERC that regulates the ECG is asking for a timetable. That's right. So how does, how does that become my problem? Mm. The PERC knows better than I do. They have more information than I do. So if the PRC is demanding for a timetable, what is wrong with it? Clearly, then it means Napo is not even in touch with the PRC. He doesn't know his job. Because if the PRC that regulates the ECG, that is a major player in the energy sector, is asking the ECG and is asking government to come out with a timetable. The ECG says it's an issue of transformers. Uh, that need refurbishing well, over 600 of the them. They say check, it's other issues, localized problems. At the last check, the ECG said they had solved all their problems. And now it's a problem with Gridco. That's right. Yes. So if it's a problem with Gridco, 
Napo owes you an apology then. Mm. He owes the Ghanaian people an apology. Well, Gridco says actually in an intercepted memo that it's an issue of generation. Ah, well, so then that doesn't become the problem of the ACG then. Mm. If it's a problem of generation, then it has to do with VRE, because Grid only takes power from VRE and then the terminal plants, and then they supply. There's an the interesting ACG. school of thought that's floating on, on social media, um, and, and that has caused people to say that the NDC is not battle ready. That, for example, when uh, Ghanaians were going through doom saw back then, it was all John Dramani Mahama's fault. But in this current 2024, we're seeing a, a delegation of blame. Is it ECG, Grid Co? Um, we're not putting that all on on uh, on Ekufado. So some are questioning the tactics that uh, the NDC is, they say, soft. No, we are not soft. We are a responsible opposition. Mm. We are not like the NPP and we will never be like them. That is how come when people say that all of us are the same, we don't agree. Mm -hmm. We are reasonable. We are the midwives of Ghana's democracy. The midwives? Uh, exactly. We mm. birth Ghana's democracy. That's, that's the fourth republic you and I are enjoying that 1990 constitution. We right. birth it. Mm. And so if yeah, it's like the proverbial uh, Bible, uh, the, the story in the Bible, Solomon, and then the, the lady who slept on her child, and then the other one, and said they should cut the child into two, and the other lady said, no, you leave the child. Mm. We are the other lady who said, leave the child. When he grows up, we can all send him or her. Do you understand? Mm. Because we understand, and we brought this democracy, we won't destroy it. When the MPP wanted political power, they were so bent. They used lies. They used every tool available to them to destroy what we call our democracy. We are not going to do the same. If it is a problem with Great Co, you see, we must hold our institutions accountable. Mm. The politics of deciding that because you are the politician, you are the figure, let me dent your image. When we do that, we give politics a bad name. Mm. And so when civil servants get it wrong, we don't blame civil servants, we blame politicians. And in doing so, we give politics a name that doesn't make it look attractive for people who have the experience and the right skills to get in to come and help fix the problem. That shouldn't be the case. And so if institutions are getting it wrong, let's hold the institutions accountable. Forgive us. But if we have to call out a president, on many occasions we've called out a president. If we have to call out a vice president, we call them out. But we will not call out a president and a vice president because we are looking for political power when institutions are getting it wrong. When we do that, we let institutions get away with their rot. Mm. That is how come Jane Mensa says at the Electoral Commission and does things anyhow. Because when she was called before the Supreme Court, instead of the Supreme Court allowing her to mount the dock, and then ask her to account for her stewardship, the Supreme Court left her off the hook. That is how come the last District Assembly elections was a mess. Because if she had been, if she had been cross-examined in that dock, if she had been held accountable as an institution, as the head of the institution, she would have done things differently. But because things were done anyhow at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court left her off the hook. Because we don't want to hold the institutions accountable. If we continue to do this, it is our democracy that will suffer. We need stronger institutions, not strong men. Mm. So let's build our institutions and let's hold our institutions accountable. If it is the ACG, let's call them out. If we call out the ACG, somebody has the ultimate responsibility of dealing with the ACG. That is the Minister of Energy. So let's go and hold the Minister of Energy accountable. If it is the President, if the Minister of Energy gets it wrong, it's the President that we should call out. Then the President will be called out. And that is how we should do our politics. But we will not do politics because the politics of convenience. Let me call out Helen. Mm. Uh, it's Helen's job I'm looking for. President Mama and the NDC doesn't believe in that. Mm. We believe in building stronger institutions. And so we'll do what is right. And in doing what is right, we will call out the people who are getting it wrong. And if need be, to call out the president or the vice president, because the ultimate responsibility lies with them, we will call them out. Let's go to the House of, of Parliament. We know that the makeup in the House of Parliament is 137, 137, with one independent uh, uh, MP who has pledged to do business with exactly. the majority side. So we call them the majority. There were a lot of us who were very excited by uh, what we know in other jurisdictions as a hung parliament. We thought this is going to be a game changer. From where you sit, what has been the impact of having uh, this 137, 137 divide in the House of Parliament? I've had calls to, you know, squint uh, sometimes at the minority MPs whether or not they've taken full advantage of this makeup in the House of Parliament. Loans have come and gone that have been approved. Um, you know, we only hear later on some gripes from the NDC minority side on things that, you know, they should have maybe challenged in the House of Parliament. Has that hung Parliament served the Ghanaian people? Are you seeing the impact? Are you feeling the impacts, George? The, um, the, at the beginning of everything, there's what we call two-thing problems. Mm. And so 
it is the first time in our history that we are getting this kind of parliament. Right. Ghanaians were not prepared for it. Was the NDC prepared for it? N nobody. When I say Ghanaians, the NDC is part of Ghanaians. Nobody sure. was prepared for a hung parliament. Mm. And so it has come as a novelty. It has come as a new thing to all of us. Adjusting to new things is always a problem. But I believe that the minority has done very well in holding government accountable, by and large. Let's look at the issues of E levy. That's right. And how long it dragged on. Mm -hmm. In time past, it would have just gone through. Yeah. The issues of approval of ministers. Let's look at how some ministers have had to go through the grading processes and even suspending parliament so that some negotiations will have to be done before ministers were approved. Let's look at how budgets have been passed under this parliament and how difficult it has been for government to get this budget through to the extent that even people who are sick have to be put on sick beds to be brought to parliament. And mind you, a lot of times it's been 138, 137. A lot of times mm. on some of these bad loans that this government has approved. And you know, when it comes to this vote, it's just a simple majority. So when you have all their 137 and 138, including their member, including the member of parliament for Boston uh, Tree, who decides to vote with them, clearly there is nothing a minority can do. But in many, many instances, all our 137 have stood up and voted for what we believed in. Just recently, look at it, the impasse between the Speaker and the President. And the That's Speaker right. not agreeing to the approval of ministers and asking that there is a cut order. In time, mm. we have just gone through. And so we cannot criticize the minority so much. But I believe that they have done very well. They have held their own against this government. And mind you, this government is a bully. For the first time in the history of this country, we saw the military invade parliament. That's right. And that is a signal that anywhere else, in, in, in any advanced democracy, whoever gave that order today would have been behind bars. Mm. Because, you see, the moment the military enters the chamber of parliament, it's a coup d'etat. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. But we saw it happen in this country. And even that, the minority held their own against them. That's right. And ended up electing Speaker Babin with all the mess that went on. Speaker Babin still got elected as a Speaker of Parliament. And so we can only, only appreciate the efforts that have been put in by this government. And mind you, apart from Parliament with the minority that has been able to hold this government in check, I say this without any fear, that almost all other state agencies have been compromised, right from the judiciary to the last, apart from parliament. And parliament George, you're adding the, the judiciary to this. I think we've got to be, 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 <laughs> be measured. The Honorable Kandapa, the National Security Minister, mm. in his address to the nation, told the judiciary that the 909 is becoming one too many. Because you see, These what, unanimous decisions you're yes, referring the, to? Yes. Right. It's becoming one too many. And sometimes, and sometimes, it is good to even give some of the decisions to the minority. I didn't say this. What does the National Security Minister know that I don't know? Mm. And so clearly, and the perception out there is that the judiciary is compromised. It's not me saying it. That is the, the, the feelers that you pick when you and put then, your ear to the ground. A lot of people have said it time with our number. Mm. The judiciary, quite recently, the NDC had caused rights on the Daphne Macbo case mm -hmm. and then the Richard Alaska case right. on the LGBT issue. Mm -hmm. That a case that was brought before you first had not been listed anywhere. A case that was later in time had rather been listed. Is that not up to the, ju uh, uh, the judiciary's discretion you see, you to see, prioritize? You see, you see, you see discretion. Mm. There is a bill before Parliament That's right. that is asking the president to assert. Is he, Passing of bills. Mm -hmm. If the president refuses not to assent to it, there is a procedure that it can come back to Parliament after a certain number of days. It becomes law. Mm -hmm. The president is refusing to accept the bill because there is a there is a um, there is an injunction That's right. before him. Mm -hmm. So if the judiciary does not prioritize that, because Parliament is the second arm of government, and so there is an impasse between the executive and then Parliament. That's and right. And the judiciary doesn't see the need to deal with that issue first and foremost, then it leaves much to be desired. And so if you're talking about priorities, mm. an issue that involves the president of the republic should be given topmost priority. Mm. So what kind of discrimination and what kind of, um, what word did he use? Discretion. Discretion. What kind of discretion is that? Mm. Is that how you exercise? And mind you, the constitution reminds you that in exercising of discretions, it should be fair and candid. Absolutely.
What is the NDC going to do about the National Cathedral? We've sunk so much money into it. Everybody wants to know, what, how do we move forward? What's going to happen? Do we turn it into, I think I've heard some people suggest some maybe children's hospital. Um, I don't know, do we carry on with the cathedral to the glory of God? Maybe it'll take us 100 years like we've seen in other uh, cathedrals, D.C., Sagradia Familia, all over the world. Would you maybe do that? Helen, you made a pledge to God. That you build him a cathedral. Me? No. Uh, I was going to say, me, I didn't make any pledge. So I didn't it promise. Is another banquet's pledge to God. That's right. The people of Ghana have made no pledge to God. Mm. And yesterday, President Mama put it in a very class card form that if you ask God that you have $400 million and that you want to build a cathedral for him, God will tell you no. Because children are still sitting under trees. Mm. When it rains, children are not able to cross rivers to get to school. People are dying on our roads because they are narrow. Four hundred million dollars can do a dual a, a dual carriage, mm. right from Accra all the way to Kumasi, right from Accra all the way to Elubo, right from Accra all the way to Wena Flower. Build many children's hospitals. Have kidney centers set up around the country. Do many other things. Uh, eradicate schools and batteries so that when it rains, quite recently I saw a video on one of your platforms where it was raining and then the whole building caved in on students. Mm. $400 million, that is what it can do. God will never, under the current circumstances we find ourselves, ask you to build a cathedral. If Christians on their own decide that we want to build a national cathedral, we should be willing. I'm a Christian. I'll be more than willing. Did you donate to the short code? They put a short code out for all of us. Uh, because I don't trust the batch that was there. Nanado and his people. You don't, don't, you don't want us to build it to I the glory. I don't trust Nanado So you didn't donate? People. The committee that was put in place lacked confidence. Mm. When somebody has three or two multiple personalities, how do I give my money to such a person? Are you referring to uh, <laughs> uh, Reverend, Reverend Kusibuatin Kum Kusibuatin. Kusibuatin. Okay. How do I give my money to such a person, such a character? I won't. Because I don't trust them. But if there is a proper committee, and then Christians decide that we want to build a cathedral, and the church is leading, I will be the first to donate. I have supported many churches I attend. Mm. I give donations to them. I support them. And so if I have to support another church to build an ark for God, to build a temple for God, it's a list of my problems. I will do it. What should we do with the National Cathedral as it stands now? As it stands now. Yes, what should we do? Well, an audit should be done. Anybody who has misused or done things on time should be punished. And then wherever our monies are should be retrieved. If monies, people should be surcharged to pay whatever monies that have gone to them unlawfully. And when that is done, as a nation, we need to have a discussion as to what to do with that million dollar pit we have dug. Mm. As to whether we are going to fill it with garbage or whatever, we all as a country we we'll have to sit down and discuss what to do with that pit we have dug. That is the most expensive hole in the world anyway, if you know. And we've dug it out there. So whatever. Because how do you, is he, and I keep saying that, uh, the man who said the answer from when, is he still around? Who said that? Professor, Prophet, uh, Professor uh, Imate, the former president moderator, my own, he's my very good friend. Ah. This is the time for him to ask the answer from when. Because accommodation for judges were out there. That's right. At that state again, if we are looking to build a cathedral, we had vast land around the Dodo area. Mm. The side of Accra was too congested. Right. Why not go set it up somewhere else and leave all those buildings? Today, you break down all those buildings at a huge cost. That's right. Compensations have not even been paid to private developers who had properties out there. In fact, we, we, the, the, they, they took the state to court. So, we, yes. like you say, we owe some yeah, money. We owe them. So, when we quantify actually how much we've lost, adding so the, much. we have to put judges that up, pay their you, rent, all of that. That should tell you that President Anara Dankwa, President Anara Dankwa and his team, Mahmoudou Baumia and Co., did not exercise good discretion in deciding to put up the, the National Cathedral, even at this location, because they could have cited it elsewhere and saved all of us that unnecessary cost. When Muslims in this country decided to build a National Mosque, they did not resort to state funding. That's right. They resorted to private funding. And so what stops Christians, which I am one, from resorting to private funding to put up a cathedral if we want to serve God? But if I wake up and I dream and I make a pledge to God as an individual, 
I should fulfill that pledge on my own, not use state funds because I have the ability, or I sit as president and so I can use state funds. It is wrong. Mm. And the Kufado got it wrong. And we must tell him in the face that Anado, you got it wrong. Mm. And that you didn't have to do this. Well, we see what becomes of that very expensive hole or pit as it has been uh, described and uh, what actually the future of, of, of all of that is. But let's talk about uh, retirees who are still at post. Uh, my colleague Johnny Hughes, as I say, he says, let the retirees go and let the young grow. In fact, Professor Kwabna Frimpon Boazing, renowned cardiothoracic surgeon, one time um, uh, minister, uh, he says that uh, young people in Ghana have a future that they can no longer afford to postpone. And it sticks with me all the time when I, I, I think about the future of us young people. Uh, you know, as a youth organizer of the NDC, from where you sit, what do you make of all of this? You know, retirees still at post contract extensions. President Mama has given the clearest indication that he's going to work with a lot of young people. Mm. On Friday, when he commissioned the youth secretariat, he said he was going to have the most youthful cabinet ever in the history of Ghana. Yesterday, at the dialogue at the Wisconsin University, he made the same call again that when he is elected president, he's going to have the he's going to have a very youthful cabinet, the most youthful ever in the history of Ghana under the Fourth Republic. So clearly, he has given an indication that he's going to work with young people. I believe that if you are above a certain age and it is time for you to go on pension. You must bow out gracefully so that somebody else takes your spot. We have a private sector, a public sector, that is not big enough to accommodate everyone. Mm. But when even we are not recruiting new people, we do what we call replacement. So if Helen turns 60, and Helen is supposed to go home, right. and Helen refuses to go home, what it means is that I that I'm supposed to take over from you, I am denied that opportunity. And I don't think it is proper. And so if you are past a certain age, and we are pleading in another bank with Kufado. I remember four or five years ago, my deputy Ed Magbana even went to court on some of these states, um, state agencies mm. that had people above 60 occupying them. Gihok still has Kofi Juma, who is almost 70 something mm. at post. I understand El Shaddai, uh, Amesh Shaddai or something. Reverend Dr. Amesh Shaddai, <laughs> yes. He's to go home. But even that... Mm. Well, I think he's they, recently they, gotten some, some extension, extension to do an, uh, an advisory role. Well, uh, even that his, he worked four years without a contract and now they've gone back to... I've seen uh, something on social media. It's a retrospective... Uh, 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 <laughs> it's... it's <laughs> a Kufa, I don't know, go kill us, so... <laughs> So the, the, that, that is making us see various forms of governance. Mm. Yes, these things are not done. These things are not done. Mm. The man had no contracts. He did not employ the man legally. And just when issues come up before Parliament, you go and do this letter. You see, and if you're watching us on Facebook, you can take a look. The letter is up on our screens, dated the 26th of March, 2024. That purports said uh, to have uh, g uh, given Reverend Amishadai an extension of his tenure. So it says the further extension of service as Commissioner General of Ghana Revenue Authority. So for those of you who had questions, that letter there states that there was a, an extension from the 11th of October. I beg your pardon. Yes, from 11th of October all the way up until the 30th. 31st of March. You see, when, when you do this, this is bad governance. This is not a way to go. And so this, this is another avenue for corruption. That is why we call him the mother serpent of corruption. Because when you do this, you open up the state to unnecessary issues. Mm. Why would you even... Do? Because the man was there without a contract. You know, when he went before Parliament, when he was even being asked his age, the yes. deputy minister was telling him not to answer. Yes, it became a very big issue exactly. about whether or not this should be confidential information. How does it become confidential when my taxes are used in paying That's you? right. I have the right to know what your age is mm. before I employ you. That is right. It is the people who have called you. Parliament is the people. So you have a responsibility before the people to tell us what your age was. The next Mahama administration government, if they come into power, will, will not, we will we'll, see we'll things like see, this. We will never see things. But you never saw things like this under President Mahama. During his four years as president, there was nothing like this. And you won't see a thing like this. He's a responsible leader that believes in the average Ghanaian. And he will not do a thing like this. That will never happen under John Mahama. Give me one proof that suggested that during John Mahama, such letters went out. Mm. 
We won't do a thing like this. President Mama is a real Democrat. He believes in the rule of law. He's a patriot. He won't do things like this. He won't administer the country like he's managing his home privately. No. What Nanado and Baumia has given us is like how you manage your home when you don't care. Mm. My 11 year old son will do a better job than what Nanado is doing. That's quite harsh, George. It's not harsh, but that is the reality. But his governance style is a C type of government. C type? Of course, yes. Expand. Ah, but he's a C student from the University of Ghana. And George, let's, make, been, let's move on. Where, where, where you president. are taking me, I don't want to go. Ever since he's become with you. president, all our light here. Done. George, our light here. And a number of you sharing some of your thoughts and comments on the stream. Do keep them coming. And we're going to be cashing out. Uh, today, so make sure you're playing. Star 439 hash, it'll cost you five CDs pet to play. And you know we're giving out cold hard cash in the mornings. I'm not too sure. We're giving out 1,000 CDs, 500 CDs this morning. 500, 500 CDs. Shop, 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 shop. Star 439 hash, choose option one and make sure that you are cashing out this morning. It is some 11 minutes past the hour of nine. You're still live here on 3FM Sunrise on 3FM and 92.7. We're speaking with NDC Youth Authority organizer george opare ado george what uh, happens with free shs we're hearing things like review cancellation what is uh, the former president's position uh, on the free shs policy should we be worried should parents be worried about a cancellation if the ndc comes back into power the ndc has never said anywhere mm. and we emphasize never said anywhere that will cancel free shs and mind you article 25 of the constitution once it has come as a policy, no government can come and cancel it. Mm. The NDC started free SHS for day students. Mm. Mind you, I was there as an MC, and I remember between 2016, 2015, 2016, all day students went to school for free. The idea behind the e-blocks was to build community day senior high schools in communities so that day students, because they everywhere around this world, there is a price for boarding education. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to do free SHS, you needed one to expand infrastructure. And so we started building the community day secondary schools so that people could And they were it. in the center of the communities or were they, but there's some comments about them being in the bush and so on and so forth. I, have you studied anything about development before? No, please. Okay, so when you do developments, mm. you realize that when you are building, easy, when you are building structures, like right. schools, hospitals, because one, our land tunnel system is always a challenge. Mm. If you even want land in the center of town, right. it's going to be too expensive to acquire. Mm. And when you build it at the outskirts, the town grows to meet it there. Then you get a big land. You you get a big land that you are looking for. Right. Also, you're able to build other infrastructures around it. But none of the schools was built in any bush. Mm. None of the schools, and. Where most of the schools were sited, they are around, they are scattered. It is within the community, but not in the center of the community. Okay. Because there's a school. Mm -hmm. And you cannot build a school in the huts or in the center next to a market. Of course. There will be a lot of distractions. That's right. And so you site them at a certain location. And then once the school is built at a certain location, you find people building hostels closed. Development moves towards the school. Mm. At Shumata School when it was built. At this other college when it was built. St. Augustine's, all the big schools we see today, they were not built in the center of town. Mm. They were built at the outskirts of town. And development grows to meet it. And that is how development is done. It is people who lack understanding of development that speak like that. Oh, the schools were sited in bushes. Mm. It is not true. No school was sited in any bush. Mm. It was built on the outskirts. Because you are looking for maybe 20 acres, right. 30 acres. Right. In the middle of the town, you will not find You will not find acres. that. Mm. Are you looking at a school growing in future? Yes. So you need 40, 50, 60 acres of land so that when the school is growing, you can now have more land to build other things on. And that is what we did. So we started free senior high education for day students. What the NDC has said is that we will review the current senior high education system we have. And we've said that when we come, one of the first things we'll do is to abolish the shift system. Okay. 
but we are not going to cancel free SHS. It has come to stay. No government can cancel it. Mm. And so we won't cancel it. Okay. A review, but not <coughs> a cancellation. George, as we wrap up on this conversation, the month is April, not too long until December uh, 7th approaches. Uh, what else is on the bill for the NDC, the building Ghana tour? You said it's still ongoing. Yes, the um, what tour. else are, are we to um, expect? We'll be adoring our running mates. We'll be launching our manifesto. Our campaigns will be launched, and then we'll hit the ground running. Mm. But this year's campaign is going to be slightly different. That I can assure everybody who is listening to us. Mm. Helen will treat you as an individual. We'll treat Johnny as an individual. We'll right. treat everybody as an individual. Mm. And our messaging will be targeted towards you, the individual. What your needs are, what your aspirations are, and what you need to hear. And that is exactly what we'll be doing. Mm. I want to assure everybody listening to me this morning that we have a Dex for Volunteers at the NDC's National Youth Secretariat. Anybody who wants to volunteer his time to serve the NDC, you have a DEX. So please come in. We'll give you a role to play, and then we can all work to build the Ghana we want. President Mama is promising positive change. President Mama is promising that we'll build a Ghana that we all want to see together. And so if you are looking for change, if you are disappointed in this government, if this government has not met your dreams, your aspirations, if this government has let you down, if you are not happy with the way this country is being governed, let me remind you, we are not the same. The NDC is different and totally different from this administration. The NDC is manned by able and capable people that care about Ghana. The NDC is the only government that comes into power and thinks about the development of the Ghanaian, irrespective of where you come from, which tribe you belong to, which creed you belong to. The NDC cares for you. And John Ramani Mama is promising you that he will build the Ghana you want together. So please, join the NDC's train. Let's change this government. Let's build for all of us a government for the people, by the people, that reflects the need and aspirations of the people. Thank you so much for your time, George, this morning. It's been a pleasure, succinct and informative. Thank you for uh, gracing our studios. I know this won't be the last time that we have interactions. There's a lot that I want you and I to sink our teeth into. Um, and next time, maybe we'll have some other uh, 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 reps here so that uh, we can spar a little bit because the phone lines are, are blinking. I'm sure some of you have a lot to say about this, but George will be taking leave of us. And uh, this is still 3FM Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. We're going to be talking about... Uh,